Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about gap now. Gap, I'm going to call it gap. It's generally accepted accounting principles. So know that gap, generally accepted accounting principles. What, are, what is gap? Gap is a bunch of information that, hey, we remember this, relevant, reliable, and comparable, right? I mentioned that this is important. You're going to hear this a ton. It's how do we make all of those transactions relevant, reliable, and comparable? But, so how do we make all the companies follow the same framework? Uh, we use gap. So there's thousands and thousands of pages of different situations that you can go through and how to account for those situations. And being an accounting student, you might say, hey, there can't be that many, right? There can't be that, like, there's not that much. Well, try to think of all the different types of businesses. You could sell a plane. You could be selling hardware, software. You could be selling, you could not be selling things. You could be a nonprofit or you could be a government. So there's thousands of pages and thousands of pages of interpretations for how to make this in, in all the transactions that could happen in the world relevant, reliable, and comparable. Um, there's also international standards called IFRS. So companies that aren't on the US stock exchange can register under a modified standard called IFRS, uh, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. Um, these are set by the, this is set by the International Accounting Standards Board. Uh, most companies that working in the US are gonna be working in GAAP, but I have friends who also work in IFRS. There's an effort to make them similar, but they'll probably never be the same. There's an effort to try to make one universal standard, but international and US relations are always a challenge. So uh, there's a lot of overlap and similarities, but the general rule is U GAP, US GAP has, is more rule-based where we have explicit situations that you have to follow, while international reporting is more judgment-based, where if there's a gray area, there's a lot more gray area to the accounting. And so make sure you, from this, make sure you know what gap is, you know this definition, you know that it's related to relevant, reliable, and comparable information, and make sure you understand that there's also international standards, um, which are set by the International Accounting Standards Board, and that there is a goal to try to make them more similar. So both the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, and the uh, IASB, the international, so this is the US, the FASB is the, uh, the US one, and the IASB is international, are building conceptual frameworks to set accounting standards. So this includes, uh, hey, what's our objective for the information? What are some characteristics and elements of this information? And how ultimately can we recognize that? And this is how the standards are written. And you eventually, we're not gonna go too much into the guidance today, but eventually you can get into what I do which I'm a, I was a technical accountant, which is the job is very similar to what you'd imagine a lawyer would do, or my job is to read the law. You can think of these as the laws of accounting. So I go back to the laws of accounting and then interpret very complex transactions and make arguments and write memos based on those complex transactions for what those conclusions should be related to it. And it's all based off this framework. Uh, so that's a technical accounting as a whole field you can get into if you like writing and arguing. So, I highly recommend, please memorize that there, these two are conceptual frameworks and all the conceptual frameworks have these four elements, objectives, qualitative characteristics, elements and recognition and measurement. And so the whole idea of this is we, a comp, the world might say, hey, now we're selling uh, Bitcoins, we're selling cryptocurrency, that's new. How should we recognize revenue related to cryptocurrency? And so they'll set an objective, they'll identify all the qualities of cryptocurrency, maybe the elements that need to be concerned in the financial statements, and then top accountants from around the world or around the country will then get together and argue about how it should be treated and ultimately develop something very similar to a law, which is the conceptual framework. So there's four, there's many underlying principles of accounting and you need to memorize them all. Um, and they would, they're what drive how we do all of our transactions. So there's the measurement, full disclosure, revenue recognition, and expense recognition principles. So these are general principles that are really driving the fundamental, uh, fundamental way we transact and these frameworks that we just talked about. So we'll go into all of those in a second. We also have assumptions that we make as accountants. 
going concern, monetary unit, time period, and business entity, and we have constraints. And so we'll talk about all of those in the next few slides. Uh, but that's how that's how it's all run. We hey, we have principles, we have these theories that we really want everyone to follow, and assumptions we're going to make so they follow them, and then some things that just don't make sense. Uh, so we we are constrained by some of our information. So what are the accounting principles? We have the measurement principle or the cost principle. And so accounting information, everything in financial statements is measured in dollars. And we measure it in cost. So there's two thoughts, right? I bought a, I bought a house last year, let's say. And that house might have been worth $500,000, right? But now it's worth $600,000 what should be my transaction? What should be my value on my financial statements? Should it be 500,000? Should it be 600,000? Should it be an average of the two? Should it, should, how am I supposed to report it? And so accounting principles have determined always at cost. We're not going to assume the value of the asset is at a gain. And so everything we paid for, because things change in value all the time. Like Starbucks was two bucks last year and now it's 225, right? That things change in value all the time. So whatever we paid for it is what we're gonna put on our financial statements. That's the cost principle, it's that actual cost. And that's more complex than you can think. Like what is the cost? Hey, do I include tax? Do I include, if I bought a piece of land, do I include the parking lot on it? So there's a lot of rules around this, but ultimately what is the cost of it? We have the revenue recognition principle. There's more complexities around this nowadays. I, I'm an expert in this area, but I, uh, I'm gonna keep it simple, where we recognize revenue when it's earned. Or another way to think of it is when we have an obligation that's satisfied. So that means if you paid me today a million bucks and said, hey, Devin, you're an awesome accountant. I'm gonna give you a million bucks. You work for me the next five years, but I'll give you a million dollars today and you're just you're my guy for the next five years. Could I recognize that revenue today? No, because I have an obligation. I haven't earned that money. I just got an upfront payment, but I haven't earned it. I have to work for five years to get that money. And so I can't recognize that revenue until it's earned, right? I can't recognize it until it's earned. And so that's, that's the whole revenue recognition principle. It also means that we don't need it to be in cash. I could work for you. And as long as I expect to get cash in the future, or maybe you want to give me your house instead, I can, I can still recognize revenue. And then I measure revenue ultimately by the cash value of the items and the cash I expect to receive. There's also the expense recognition principle. This is a different way of thinking. Um, expense recognition principle, or we, what we call the matching principle, where we recognize expenses to the revenues they earn in accounting. How is this different than everyday life? Well, I might pay for my lease. I might lease a building for a year, right? I might say, hey, I'll pay you $10,000 for my office for the next year on day one. But I am using that office to make revenue for the next year. So what we'll need to do is called amortize that expense equally for the whole year. Or what if I'm selling goods, but I bought, I bought a bunch of goods, I bought, I'm selling phones, and I bought a bunch of phones today, but I sell them next year. I wouldn't recognize expense today. I recognize it when I sell the good and recognize revenue. Expenses only are recognized when revenue is recognized. This is called the matching principle. Memorize these. This is the fundamental thing that's going to drive. That's different than what we do. We use a credit card to, use an exp to match an expense for something that we might not recognize revenue on for another year. We need to match the expenses with the revenue. Same thing if you buy a car. That's why we have depre these concepts called depreciation, amortization, capitalization. We're going to go into all of these. And then finally, we have the full disclosure principle, where at the end of the day, we're required to give enough details to so an investor can read a financial report and understand the business. And so this goes into something called non-monetary exchanges. What if, what if I decide to, hey, I want to give you my car worth $10,000 and you give me your car worth $16,000. Based on the revenue recognition principle, I should still recognize revenue, but I should also, on the full disclosure principle, disclose that, hey, that $16,000 of revenue was in exchange for my car, which was worth $10,000. So in reality, I really only made 6,000 bucks on this, right? Like we need to be honest 
and, and tell a story with our numbers. And so all of this goes to, like you can look up any company today and, and I'm gonna just show this as an example. Let's look up Apple, oh, no, apple.com, Apple 10K. You can look up a 10K and that's, that's what's driving all of these, all of this information. So Apple's quarterly report here, you can look up any co public company and it's a 50 plus page report that goes through their sales and it tells a story about the business. And that's where the full disclosure principle comes from. We tell a whole story about, hey, what's happening with the business? And you can see it'll go through all the accounting policies and disclose everything and how a company operates. So if you're ever interested in learning about a business, you can just read, read it. After you learn this class, you should be able to read one of these reports and learn a lot about a business. That's accounting principles. To operate under these accounting principles, we have to make some assumptions. And these are just assumptions we've made because it's the best, the best we can do with the information we have. The first assumption we make is going concern. You need to memorize these terms, going concern assumption. The going concern assumption, we make the assumption that a business is gonna continue to operate indefinitely. Is this an accurate assumption? Probably not, right? This is probably not the, uh, uh, true because most businesses close within 100 years. A any business we know now will likely be gone in 100 years, right? Uh, things change, but we have to make an assumption that businesses will operate indefinitely. Otherwise, we will have to assume that it will be sold in the future and that's just not helpful for anyone. We'd have to assume that all of these assets that a business owns will be sold in the future. So we make this assumption called the going concern assumption. If you ever hear about a going concern, issue with a company, it means that they're probably not going to survive for the, in the next year. And so as an accountant, every time we assess a company, we need to ask, hey, is this going to be around the next year? And if they aren't, then we no longer use gap accounting because we can't assume they're a going concern. We use something called liquidation-based accounting where we assume they're going to be sold. Then we have the monetary unit assumption. We're going to assume everything can be transacted Everything can be valued from your employees. Everything has a dollar to it. And so if you're uh, a liberal arts major or if you like communism, this might not be a really fun concept here, right? Like everything has a dollar, but we can't, we can't uh, value. We, we need everything to have the same value, right? We need everything to have the same denominator when we're using, a, uh, when we're using this method. And so there's some things maybe we, we can't value and we're not gonna put those in the accounting statements. Right, like maybe there's some kind of uh, environmental benefit. Like maybe this company is able to uh, use less trees than, an, than another paper company. That's really not going to be in this because we can only assess transactions in events of monetary units. In other business courses, you'll learn about like a balanced scorecard and other things we use to, to do non-economic transactions. But for accounting, we're looking at dollars and cents. We care about the green. Um, the business entity assumption, this is a really tough thing for most students, but it's so simple. So I really want you to get it and always think about this. Your business is not you. You are not your business. So if I am running a consulting firm, that is separate than who I am. That means if my consulting firm makes money, that my business has made money. I have not made money. My business can then pay me a salary. My business can then give me a disbursement or I can invest in my business. But these are two separate things. A business is its own economic entity. A business is its own person. You can file for a C Corp and a business becomes its own person. These are separate, they have separate bank accounts. You're not supposed to intermingle them. Legally, you're not supposed to intermingle them from an accounting perspective. The sooner you get this, the easier the class is gonna be because there's gonna be complex questions like, hey, what if you put $10,000 into your own business? What if I put $10,000 into my own business? I, a lot of students struggle where they say, well, $10,000, I'm paying myself, so nothing happens. No, we're get paying our business. We're the business gets cash. You didn't lose cash. Your business gets cash in exchange for stock. So we'll talk about that, but always remember they're separate. You're going to need to remember this. Uh, and then the time period, you're going to assume that we can divide a company generally within a year. So we can report a yearly and quarterly information. Memorize all the accounting assumptions. 
And then we talked about constraints. I think that's more important here. Materiality and cost benefit. At the end of the day, uh, let's say we have a Google or uh, Apple, right? Apple up here. Apple makes billions and billions of dollars, right? Their financial statement, they report numbers in the millions. So they have $40 billion in cash on hand. Do you think Apple, it would be helpful to investors for Apple to talk about how they sold, uh, how they spent $100 on toilet paper for an office? No, right? It, does, it doesn't make any sense. So we have this concept of materiality where only information that would influence a decision maker is what we include in our reports. So based on the, if a larger company, then we're gonna report larger big transactions. Smaller company, smaller transactions. We also do a cost benefit analysis. So at the end of the day, accounting doesn't add true value to the world other than through this information. But we aren't selling a product, we aren't the product. So at the end of the day, we need to make sure that whatever we do doesn't hinder the business. And so we need to be efficient. So we only provide information where the benefits outweigh the cost. At the end of the day, we can always find more information that'd be useful, but some of it we can't report based on cost benefit. It's important to learn this. You're going to learn this all throughout your business education, but there's lots of different ways to structure a business. We have a proprietorship, a partnership, and a corporation, and there's different structures for each of these as well, like limited partnerships, limited liability partnerships, C-Corps, S-Corps, we'll go into it eventually. But the concept here is um, sometimes you can structure a business to be taxed differently, to be owned separately, to be have different types of liability defense, to be separate entities, they all are separate entities, to be separate legal entities, or to have separate lives. And so just memorize this slide that we can structure our businesses in legal ways to get different advantages from tax advantages to legal advantages to liability advantages. And so go through this. This is one of these in-class quizzes that I highly recommend uh, you go through. And if you have questions, you, you can go back and find the answers, right? Like materiality, we know is a constraint. We know that the uh, revenue recognition, we can just go off and say revenue recognition was a principle. So just make sure this is good practices, practice for your exams. Make sure you know how to match these. I'll take a pause. Any questions? Are we all doing all right? So I'll leave it up to the class. I don't mind either way. Do you want to take a quick five, 10 minute break? There's a lot, or do we want to continue through and end class early? I'll take a vote here. Okay, keep going, cool, let's do it. So these slides are here, just memorize this. If I say need to know, just memorize it. All the answers are here too. I'm not taking the slides out. Should be easy enough. Okay, this next piece is where accounting gets interesting. And where we're gonna spend most of this class is in this concept of 